Okay, so so I've been um, asking this question in my uh, teaching, uh, graduate teaching um, at MSU recently, right? Like where does our desire to do research come from, right? And so today I'm going to share my experience um, and how uh, this desire has grown and you know, has evolved in so many ways. So this, um, I took this picture probably 10 years ago in uh, Centro Historico in Mexico City. And so it's a reproduction of Hernan Cortes, uh, one of his reports, right? This, this is early research. <laughs> um, one of his reports to La Corona, the crown in Spain, right? And so he's describing with this old Spanish, uh, obviously, um, describing the architecture of Tenochtitlan, right? And so, um, so a couple of things. First of all, he wrote the, 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 the tallest tower, the, the main tower uh, resembles the, the cathedral in Sevilla, right? So, so, so the reference, right, to for Tenochtitlan architecture is a European Catholic church. Then, um, then he starts coding, right? So the, the statues uh, in, in those, in, in the architecture, right? He, he calls them idolos, idols, right? So the unfamiliar, right? The code for the unfamiliar is idolos. Um, and, you know, like what is the code, right? For our familiar statues, right? So saints, virgins, martyrs, right? And the code for the uh, unknown uh, deities, right, is uh, monsters, right? And, and whereas, you know, our code for the familiar uh, deity is God, right? So um, uh, very early kind of like coding, right, of, of this um, early researcher. Um, so colonial imperialist uh, research. Right, so why, why am I calling research like this? And this, by the way, is in my experience reading um, and early uh, participation in research, I think most research, at least in our country, is of this kind. I'm trying to move. All right, so uh, what I find in, in this kind of research is uh, something very damaging, right? So this, this kind of research erases, reduces, and assimilates. This, kind of, this is what this research has done to me, right? It has erased so many times, erased um, the inside of me, right? Uh, my feelings, uh, my right to be close to participants, uh, this research also has reduced um, what participants have to share. And the, the whole purpose of doing this is, uh, the way I see it, is assimilation. And, you know, I, I admit this, and, and I'm embarrassed to admit this, that, uh, you know, my early uh, uh, research practices uh, were of this kind. Right, so I was participating in colonial and imperialistic research. And let me also add that I am not completely free from these uh, forces, from these influences. It's, uh, it's a process that I see as continuous. It's a process that I see as, um, you know, always uh, revising, always uh, being uh, critical and being careful about how I am doing uh, this kind of research. And I really appreciate, you know, my, when my students catch me, right, um, and when I teach them and when they catch my language and then they point to the language, right, and so um, it's because of that. It's because, you know, it has been this molar force, right, that has pushed me to do research in one way. And so, um, you know, it, it is a continuous struggle to, to, to find what Deleuze calls the, the line of flight, right? Like leaving that and finding possibilities somewhere else. So coding is colonial. Um, 
It's a colonial research practice. So I look at, I mean, we all are familiar with this. When I was a grad student, right, we were doing this color coding, right? Um, some people do line by line, um, but notice the closeness, the resemblance of this practice with something quantitative, right? We want to have a count of our codes, right? So this is, this is what, what I mean by reductionist. Um, and these are some additional damages uh, of the practice of coding. First of all, we do coding by using language. And so the, the critiques that I have read um, center around the, the, the how much power and how much we have elevated language, right? Um, to the point that you know, language is used to subjugate um, every form of expressivity by reducing everything to language. For instance, you know, um, um, our, our English language, right, and Spanish too, um, those two I'm very familiar with. So the subject, uh, verb, object, structure of that language, right? Which gives the subject all the power to do everything, to take every action on everything else, right? Human and non-human, right? So language subjugates, language dominates. Um, language also um, territorializes. Um, so this is uh, one of my favorite um, ideas. Language is not life, it gives life orders. Life does not speak, it listens and waits every other word. Even a father's to his son carries a little death sentence, a judgment, as Kafka put it. And here's another one um, that also asks about the kind of, lang kind of language that we live with the kind of language that we are asked to sort of like master, right? Um, and that's, that's precisely, right? The, the, the kind of language that uh, I would say in the first three years after my PhD, I started rejecting that language that reduces, that language that dichotomizes, the language that um, creates a distance. Right, not just physical distance, but emotional distance um, between me and those groups of Latino and Black students, and you know that I was working with and their teachers. Right. Um, so the other practice that I question is this idea of generalizing. And these are some of the harms associated. So, right, so the, the principle is, is pretty much like that. If, if, if something is good enough for me, it should be good enough for everyone. Here's an example, going back to Cortes in Spain and their domination, right? So in their view, um, Latin America needed their Spanish, their language. It also needed their uh, religion, right? Um, and even now, present times, right? Like it's really, um, really hard, you know, when I hear people from, from these countries, from, from Latin America, uh, being thankful for having these two things, right? That have saved, supposedly have saved us from confusion and from uh, idolatry, right? Something that we are all familiar with is you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, at some point we have been asked to include study limitations. Now, if we think about that, what people want to want us to talk about is our sample size, 
was it big enough to generalize, right? Um, at least that's the, the, the main um, um, idea that I read when people write about their limitations. And these are apologies for not being colonial enough. And the third practice that I'm going to, that I, that I have a really hard time um, accepting is validation. Um, one of the most common practices in validation is triangulation. Um, these are some harms. First of all, validation seeks uh, confirmation of one version of the story. And guess what? That version is a researcher's version. Um, this semester, you know, we talk about validation and triangulation. Um, and the question is, well, if we are triangulated, triangulating, um, isn't that supposed to bring more perspectives, more nuances? different ways of thinking about a given issue as opposed to just, you know, uh, trying to confirm one version. So more broadly, um, in my, since I started reading research um, for when I was a grad student at the UT, um, I noticed, right, I learned, I learned to notice that um, the, the, the research in the United States is ontologically weak, extremely weak. And as a result of uh, not being explicit and not, not being deep in defining the nature of those things that we study, then we come up with ways to know about those things that are also, um, that, that have serious limitations. Um, so something that I hear and read all the time is, you know, a discussion of an issue as being complex, right? So we all want our issues to, to be complex and they are, right? They are very complex. Um, and then the next thing I read is about the methodology and the analysis, right? And those things usually are everything but complex, right? So here's, a, here's an example. I did a, an extensive uh, uh, literature synthesis on teacher noticing for one of my manuscripts. And so what I found was precisely that, right? Like everyone, todo el mundo, right? They, they, they write about, you know, how complex noticing is, right? And so to ameliorate that com complexity, right? To deal with that complexity, that's when they start talking about, well, we're gonna select video clips because teachers cannot attend to everything that's happening in their classroom, right? Um, and also their analysis, you know, tends to be very hierarchical, um, insisting on, you know, the, the existence of some levels of noticing and some levels obviously are better than other levels. All right, so let's let's go into uh, um, a little bit closer to to where my desire to do research has come from. And here's where I'm going to show show you a, lots and lots of pictures. Um, so it's a little bit my attempt to uh, deterritorialize language. <laughs> so um, first of all. When I talk about research, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about bodies, right? And so when you hear me say the word um, body, what I mean is um, human and non-human bodies, okay? Uh, in the context of my, my field of research, right? So it means teachers, students, rulers, windows, carpets, everything, right? Everything is a body, right? Uh, more broadly, um, we are probably familiar with bodies of literature, right? Um, the NRC is a body. Um, if you have a dissertation committee, or if you're submitting an article to a journal, you know, the editorial boards are bodies. And also, like I said, all the bodies that participate in our research. So 
So um, I begin um, my doing research, educational research, by being told that you know what what was important is to be a body. Right? Um, notice I'm putting that in heavy uh, bold face letters, right? Because of the permanence of, of, of body, right? Um, but what I learned in so many participations and collaborations, you know, in different states, um, was that bodies are not static, right? Uh, bodies are flexible, bodies, you know, have continuities, bodies become, right? So I really learn about um, the process of becoming a body, not necessarily being a body. And so my desire to, to, to do research emerges from my becoming a body, rubbing itself against a multitude of bodies. And this includes the forces of, you know, the traditional research and the other research, right? So, so it's, it's, it's my body coming into some relationship with all these bodies. That's where my, my desire to do research um, comes from. And, and I like to see it as, you know, coming from desde adentro, you know, from, from within practice, practices, right? Um, and, and it's because these practices um, have allowed me to see external forces, external forces that um, continue uh, insistent on the being, right? And um, whereas, you know, when I am working within these this, uh, practices, really what matters is the becoming, the coming back every day and becoming somebody, something new, uh, some new concept, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was a, a grad student at UT, this is the research that I was doing. And this is, by the way, very recent research, um, a colleague of mine um, shared with me from, from the same university, right? Um, so you can see the faces, right? We don't see happiness. We don't see smiles. We don't see joy. Uh, if you look at the uh, backgrounds, the surroundings, right? Uh, it's just a bare table, a uh, piece of paper, a marker. So these are the bodies that I was sort of like order, right? To go and investigate, right? Bring your paper, bring a limited set of materials and have these bodies come into some relationship with these materials. Um, and I don't see the excitement. I don't see what, you know, uh, the recent readings, you know, talk about in terms of vibrant matter, uh, living bodies, right? Um, bodies that are enjoying, that are becoming, right? I still see, I mean, if you see, if you look at, um, let me use this. Um, if you look at that, the case of this student is very interesting. Um, the interviewer, decided that the, the, the student could not solve the problem. The, the person said, uh, do you wanna tr keep trying? The student said, yes, I'll keep trying. And then that's, that's as far as the student went, right? Like all those markings. And I'm gonna talk about the marking in the, in the red circle. But then the, the interviewer said, um, is it hard for you? And she said, yes, it's hard for me. So are you ready for the next one? And the student says, yes, I'm ready for the next one. Right? And I know, I know what happens when, the, when this interviewer takes this student work back to the UT office and it's coded, right? And guess what? It's coded as incorrect, incomplete, something lacking, right? And notice the beauty. So, the, so the, the problem here is four cupcakes that three children are, share, are sharing. So, Notice the partitioning for, first of all, the, the tendency, you know, to partition something in halves, right? So that half, for some reason, is our first encounter, I guess, with, with partitioning things. So, um, but what's interesting is the three, I mean, the two diagonal lines 
right? That, that are crossing the, the, the last two cupcakes, right? Um, to me, that is an extremely generative idea of, you know, the, the, other, the other day when I was chopping something and I was like hearing the noise of the knife, I think it was a, a I can't remember a piece of fruit or something, but when I was hearing, right? I was like, oh, that means I created three parts if I do it in a linear way, right? Or it could be like four, four parts if I do it this way and then this way, right? So just the sound, like hearing the sound. But in that case, those two lines are really the, 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 the children's thinking and working and interacting with the pen and with the lines and with the ink and paper and everything, right? Getting very close to creating, to splitting each of those two pieces in three parts. So I, I immediately see that as two thirds, right? Um, but again, I know because I participated in this kind of research, I know what happens to this, um, this kind of work. So um, the really the, the, the experience that um, served to, to open my eyes and my senses and my whole body to appreciating um, uh, students' mathematical thinking uh, was this uh, project, which ended um, in 2018. And this is the one of the final days, you know, I took a picture. Uh, it actually ended in uh, an exchange, international exchange between teachers in the United States and teachers in, um, in Chile. So, um, and here's one of our graduate students, Jose, right here. Uh, this is uh, teacher Melissa. These are the researchers from uh, Chile. Uh, the teacher from Chile is right here. And this is my colleague, Sandra, and this is teacher Megan and teacher Melissa. Anyways, um, and then um, that uh, I left my career uh, project with an intense uh, curiosity to do research by uh, involving the senses, in, involving the body but at the same time, decentering uh, the human, right? Uh, decentering the human doesn't mean, um, you know, the post-humanism doesn't mean being uh, um, inhuman or anti-human. It means, you know, we are just one among many other uh, bodies in this world, right? So this is my next uh, research project. Okay. And uh, we're gonna start uh, this, this uh, fall with uh, my uh, dear colleague Gladys Krause from um, William and Mary and uh, from with Carlos Lopez Leiva from University of uh, New Mexico. Uh, I met Carlos in Chicago when I was uh, doing a, my postdoc there. And Gladys, who knows where I met her, <laughs> but she's, she's also from UT. I think I met her at a conference. Um, all right, so, so this is, these are the, the, the forces that have inspired my research uh, to do research. So as you can see, I don't know if you remember the, the faces of the students, you know, in the, in the uh, sort of like clinical problem solving interviews. And if you look at these faces, I mean, it's completely different, right? Um, everybody's moving, everybody's, uh, some people are smiling, some people are writing, everybody's doing something, right? Um, so it comes, you know, from um, this experience of becoming with, with students and their material. So this is in Chile. Uh, we are um, in a classroom, elementary classroom. This student is creating fractions using some piece of yarn, but Notice the interesting uh, aspect of this. Um, notice how the teachers are also touching what the student is touching. So the teachers are becoming, the student is becoming also the concept of fractions. All of us, right? All of us are there um, 
interacting. That's what uh, uh, the new material is, you know, all this uh, interacting uh, with um, material bodies, in this case, the piece of yarn. My desire also comes from uh, noticing um, the vibrant matter that, that these students become. So if you look at the, the students' uh, feet, so he's jumping, right? Um, and he's collaborating with uh, Victorian, right? And, and he's pointing to information on the, on the screen, uh, but he ran immediately when Victoria needed that information. Rain immediately jumped and pointed to the information that Victoria and the teacher needed. They also, students also uh, become, their bodies become the, the mathematical concepts. Uh, this student in Lansing, uh, she was working with some peers at their table and, and they called me. They wanted me to see what this student was doing, basically the multiplication of three times four with her fingers and her fingers were sort of like, you know, going up and down. And she said, you actually don't see what I am feeling. I can feel right like this, my fingers, my three fingers touching my four fingers. Uh, I can actually feel the three times four. When students work with materials, they, um, it's just impossible, right? To, to um, interrupt, you know, the, this kind of interactivity. Uh, they are so passionate. They, they care so much about what they are doing with those materials. And they're beautiful, beautiful um, diffractive analysis, um, primarily by feminist writers, right? Uh, in mathematics, and I think in other um, areas of these, um, uh, cases where students are working with materials. In this case, um, they were uh, measuring the sugar content that they consume every day. Um, they also know how to make fractions cry. <laughs> so this project, uh, it's, it's, it's already a, a, uh, an article in, in ZDM, the, the journal um, of International Journal of Mathematics Education. Uh, and it's called the Fraction Detectives. And so they wrote um, stories. From stories, they, they turned those stories into uh, movie scripts. From there, they created their own uh, characters. Um, and so this is the story of the one third, Mr. One Third, who lost his family. And so they are detectives. So the, 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 the children are detectives. And they are helping these, these fractions in, in trouble, right? Find, in this case, find the relatives that they lost. And so the relative, you know, they use x-rays and you can see actually the, the, uh, the concept, in this case, the concept of equivalent mm -hmm. fractions, right? You can see another circle split into uh, six, right? Or into um, nines and so on, right? And so, um, yeah. So their creativity, right, and their, their imagination um, really emerges uh, from becoming, from really relating to the material world around them. In this case, um, they were creating, again, fractions. This is the, the international exchange. So they were creating uh, fifths out of a spoonful of sugar. Right? So they were like uh, emptying the, the spoonful of sugar on their tables and reshaping it in this case into a rectangle and then kind of like marking that rectangle with the handle of the plastic sugar. Uh, something beautiful about these children is that they are professionals, right? At um, sort of like grabbing a roll, right? And uh, assuming that role in a professional manner. In this case, you can see the, the, the uh, child in the red, uh, green uh, t-shirt. Um, he's handling the camera, right? And their footage is probably better than mine or anybody else. 
questions, right? So they do it with care, they do it with love. They they ask questions. They're not just you know um, um, handling the camera, but they're participating in these groups. And one thing that I really appreciate is, um, you know, uh, my transitioning from all these hierarchical ways of doing analysis to what is known as a flattened out analysis, right? So um, not just in this, you know, the, the, the visual here is kind of like a, um, um, the physical flattening of, of bodies, right? But, um, but it means, pretty much means, uh, uh, treating everything uh, that takes part in your research with the same importance, right? Nothing is more important than, than anything else. Language is not important than, than any other dimension of, of research. And of course, right? So we, as we also um, uh, care, um, we reciprocate a lot and uh, we grow together. Um, I have also learned from the immense creativity of the teachers in my projects. So this is um, when I used to attend um, conferences. I quit four years ago. Um, but um, one of the teachers put together a PowerPoint presentation using nothing but VIP her own illustration. So you can see on the left, the sketch, and then the final product, right? And actually this was a, a, a primary force for me to stop going to conferences because a conference is as, as gigantic as ARA. When I called them and I said, I'm bringing two teachers from my, my project. Can I get some um, teacher fee? And they said, I'm sorry, we don't have. Uh, fees for teachers. We have for graduate students, but not for teachers. Right? Sandra once said um, that teachers are what, imposters, right? <laughs> um, in, in those conferences, right? But it's, and so are students, so, um, so why bother? <laughs> um, and so exciting work in progress. So I'm working with um, a graduate student uh, from the Prime program. Sophia Abreu, um, she and I have started working this semester. We are illustrating um, a mathematical discussion in a, in a classroom in Lansing. And uh, tentatively, I titled this Young Philosophers. So it's a discussion about the, the concept of space, right? Um, and how it relates to uh, teaching, for instance, uh, plotting coordinates in two and three dimensions. So again, these are forces that I gravitate toward that, you know, together we assemble and we do exciting things together. Um, first of all, I would say children in the schools, they have literally re-educated me, re-educated my whole body to sense uh, meaning where traditional ways of doing research sort of like desensitize me to do that. Um, graduate students, every semester, I learn from them uh, tremendously. I have learned so much from, from Sophia, uh, her interest in seeing mathematics from other fields like art, right? Her uh, interest in, in feminist and indigenous um, uh, methodologies that, that she and I share. Um, Jose, I have also learned, you know, a lot from Jose. Um, also from, you know, so many readings, uh, philosophical readings about the ideas that I was mentioning, um, matter, bodies, um, human and non-human that have agencies that unfortunately, because of our language and our you know, um, predispositions to see our, to give ourselves more importance than the material world, right? We don't, we don't see that uh, agency in, in things, in, in the material world. I also love to see my field from um, 
different fields, right? From um, illustrated books, from short story books. Um, I often find wonderful ideas that complement, that push me to think about, you know, what is meaning in mathematics, teaching and learning. Um, and also from, uh, you know, these books about methodologies, indigenous methodologies, visual methodologies uh, that highlight things that um, really my PhD program never did. So that's the wrap. Thank you so much, Inio. Um, I think now we can just have a conversation. Um, so I have muted people as needed during uh, the talk, but now I think it might be easier to unmute if you're comfortable doing that, because then we can just step in and out of the conversation. Um, we do have quite a few people, so if anybody feels like they'd like to use the formality of raising hands, we can do that too. The only thing in the chat right now is a uh, hooray for Sophia. <laughs> Avner. Probably the only one not in the field, but anyway, thank you, uh, Hina. It was a lovely presentation and your research looks really exciting. I have a question. Actually, I mean, part of the reason that I'm uh, uh, here today is not only to hear about your work, but I'm actually, my class today in uh, uh, qualitative uh, uh, research speaks about decolonizing research and all the, the Patel book, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in in you talked about this notion of language and how language uh, uh, codifies, language colonizes, language uses power, etc. I agree. My question to you is: How do these other forms of research that you're talking about? whether it's visuals, whether it's uh, comics, whether whatever it is, they're all language, whether it's a, a, a pictorial, a painting, they're all language. So how do we escape the kinds of things that you were talking about where the subject has power, et cetera, uh, in these other forms of language that you're introducing now as you convey your research, as you codify your research in some form of language? How do you escape that? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things to, 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 to um, uh, consider. One, um, the idea of deterritorializing language does not mean let's kill language, let's, you know, we're done with language, right? That is not the idea. Mm -hmm. The idea is to um, bring it into, into perspective and to really question it. Is this the only way? That, uh, that we can make sense, that we can communicate. Actually, I think it's Latour, it's either Latour or, yeah, I think it's Latour who, who writes about expressivity, mm -hmm. right? And so how expressivities um, that, that, you know, that exist in nature, like um, in rocks and how rocks develop, you know, different layers, each layer has its own expressivity, right? Um, the colors, right? Colors that 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 exist, that that sort of like are are out there, right? Um, so um, the critique is on the over reliance on language, which, as we know, from as soon as you know uh, the humanities, right? Like to hold of research, like from I can go back as, you know, um, one century, right, of interactionism, of case studies from University of Chicago, right? So all that, you know, pretty much centered um, people, right, uh, and uh, groups of people, right, and everything, you know, that was used to analyze, you know, all those phenomena relied primarily in language, right? So when we open up a, a, a a research article, what, what do we find? Language. Um, not only that, I mean, we find people policing that language in every um, uh, journal. So the last experience that I had is you're using too much first person, singular, right? 
uh, you're not supposed to because that's not that's not what our readers are used to, right? Um, and so, so um, the idea again is to uh, expand uh, the repertoire of expressivities. Actually, comics. Um, um, do that in a way that it creates a, a synergy, right? Between text and words, right? So it's not just text, but it's like, what can we, um, how can we relate? How can, how can an image has resonance? How can an image help us with all these practices of generalizing or of, you know, validating something or even of coding something, right? How can we code um, a face of a child? Right? How can how can I code, you know, the smiles of the children that are in my research now, versus the faces of the kids that that look so unhappy in the other kind of research? So this this presentation and this conversation has had me making a, a connection between. Um, sort of someone else's story in my own story. Um, I'm, I'm autistic and being autistic, one of the big struggles is polysemy or foa me, the fact that one word can mean multiple things. And that's constantly a source of miscommunication between me and neurotypicals, either because I'm misinterpreting them or because they're misinterpreting me. Mm -hmm. um, a teacher reached out to a social media group to share a story about a student, a black autistic student uh, who started expressing a lot of hate towards white and whiteness, and to their confusion, who had also expressed surprise that some of his teachers who are white, he thought they weren't. Um, my response was polysemy. He's using a different version of the word white than you are. He's using it as, as an analog for racialized oppression, which is very reasonable and frankly, a really thoughtful version of the word. Um, so there was this miscommunication the connection for me is uh, with the title of this project, I didn't want to do research for years and years and years. I didn't want to do research because for me, it was just an analog for, for ownership and oppression. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. people kept telling me that I was made to do research, that I was going to do research, and I did not want to do it. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is, thank goodness, I eventually... I was able to discover versions of research that don't fit in with what I used to think of it as meaning, but mm -hmm. sort of can give meaning to it. Mm -hmm. and, and David, I think, you know, um, a lot of graduate students in our programs uh, are feeling that way towards research, you know, research the dirty word, right? Like read the, that kind of research that forces us into something that we're not. Right, and so I, I, that's what I mean, you know, by, you know, the graduate students being a, a really incredible force in my sort of like desire to do research. So Hinia, thanks for sharing. This is like you were just talking about, this is something that I've been reflecting on a lot as a newish graduate student. You mentioned how you had to go through a lot of critical thought, reflection, re-education to transition from doing more colonial imperialistic research to moving away from that, moving to other alternatives. I'm curious what kind of guidance you would offer graduate students who are trying to find what it means to do research, but also um, decolonize their own research. Are there any practical steps that you think might help facilitate that within the um, construct of our graduate program and the things we need to do in that program? Mm -hmm. ah, your question is so difficult, Brady, but I love it. <laughs> um, because, you know, when I choose readings that really critique all those practices, right, that I just talked about, at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, um, what's going to be the trajectory or what has been the trajectory of the, the students taking this course, right? Because I know, I know that others are teaching precisely that, right? They're, they're teaching how to code, some of my colleagues, right? I used to do that too, right? And so um, 
So it, it is challenging. Um, the, the students in my courses, you know, at, tend to ask that question. Um, so, and obviously I can only, you know, make suggestions from my own, you know, um, assemblages with, with, with these bodies that I was talking about, right? And so um, it was before, it was uh, not fulfilling. He was coming back with lots of frustration. Um, and, and really, you know, when I, when, I write, when I write those things about language, that language dominates, language um, territorializes, language, um, you know, I, I really mean that because, because I was seeing um, the participants in, in my projects pretty much put in language to those kinds of services, right? Um, and I was driving back like really like infuriated for, you know, the fact that people in those practices were not seeing the beautiful things that children are capable of doing, right? And so what it takes really for me to, to um, transition from, from that sort of like language dominance to more expressivity um, center is it's actually, it takes time, right? It takes time to be there and to see and to, like I said, to rub my body against those other bodies. That's what I need, right? Um, that takes time, right? So for a graduate student, we have what? Four or five years, right? To finish the, our programs. For really for a graduate student, you know, what it takes is our, would be our programs really thinking about, you know, providing the experience that I'm talking about as early as possible, right? Um, like really immersing all of you in these kinds of practices. And not only that, but, you know, the other thing that is more like advice for, for us as designers of these courses is to include wisdoms from other fields, right? I have learned like tons, right? From the things that I was sharing there, right? From art, from journals that have zero to do with mathematics education, right? And so uh, lots of things that, you know, that we need to sort of like think about. Uh, so the future uh, researchers, you know, really, can have a more fluid, right? Like transition, because it is not an easy transition. It's a very painful transition because all the forces, right? All the powers that are out there have sort of like pushed me, sort of like punched me, right? Sort of like, why are you doing this? And why are you citing this person? Right, and so it's from everywhere, right? But in the case of, an, of a graduate student, it's even worse, right? And so we, we really need to create as programs, we, my feel is that we really need to create all those supports, right? To, um, to, to, to prepare new researchers to do this kind of research. Thanks, Celia. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for maybe another question or comment. I just, I, I really enjoyed this talk, Eugenio. I am the other person, Avner, who's not in this field. Um, <laughs> but um, I've, I've felt since the beginning of my time as a researcher that that we do try and oversimplify the very complex uh, world of teaching and learning. It's like, it's our original sin, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I think it is in the medical field as well, which is of course what we model ourselves on. Um, but, and, and the other thing that, that I found interesting and I had to sort of interrogate myself a little bit. I'm very verbal, I'm very texty, I'm very language oriented. I mean, it's just the way I'm, I, I'm, I've always been. And I struggle when I try and put things into a visual form or try and read visual images and that sort of thing. So, um, so I've always felt very at home 
with the linguistic orientation of research and with coding and things like that. Mm -hmm. but one thing that I think helped me step out of that a little bit, and you mentioned Latour, was um, actor network theory, which of course flattens analysis by you attend to everything that comes into a field. Mm -hmm. so, uh, physical, mental, human, non-human. And um, so that's really been helpful for me in opening up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that adds to the conversation, but yeah. that's sort of where I've come from. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> See some questions in the chat. I, I think I got the right link to the article you mentioned uh, that was published in ZDM. Oh, okay. Any other comments or questions? I have a, a question. I, it might be too long. So if it is he and you just say, I don't have time for it, that's fine. You were talking about this notion of becoming, you were using Deleuze. Um, Butler also borrows that notion of becoming, and she talks about the difference between performance and performativity. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in the degree to which, well, how do you know, how do you sense that the kinds of things, the wonderful things that you showed about the students learning and how their bodies express excitement, et cetera, are in a sense a form of performativity rather than simply performance. How do we know? Uh, there's no certainties. The, 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 the easy and, and, and more direct question is that there's no certainties. Uh, we don't know. The, the answer is I don't know, right? Um, um, but when, when I am either seeing them interact with these, uh, uh, with other human bodies as well, right? Not just non-human, but, but, but human bodies as well, right? Um, and when I am considering everything as having the same uh, ontological status, right? nothing, nothing matters more than anything else, right? Um, and even when I am participating, when I am part of that uh, interactivity, um, one way of beginning to know or sensing, right, uh, happens to me, it happens across and through my whole body. Goosebumps. Um, I sometimes, you know, scream. There's a video where I'm screaming, um, you know, uh, extending my arms, uh, laughing with them, uh, moving, you know, around and running like the child, you know, running to the screen and jumping, right? Um, that's when I sense more than no. It's, it's sensing, right? And, and so it, who knows what's going to happen to that sense into those bodies in the next second, right? Um, but that's that's the evidence that I have. That's the, the kind of like the evidence that I work with, the evidence that I embrace, the evidence that I write about, right? Um, that um, you know the other way of doing research, sort of like paints all that over, right? With labels, right? So I remember my dissertation uh, chair said, you know, uh, if you're going to write some analytic uh, note or code, uh, it, it has to be about something that is observable. In other words, somebody else is supposed to see exactly the same thing that you're seeing. It's like, how in the world is that possible? <laughs> Not even my twin, right, would see the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the, the answer is not how do I know? It's more like, uh, what do I sense? It's a, it's a completely different uh, ontological, onto epistemological 
way of understanding research. And so a lot of questions, you know, that, that we ask and a lot of questions that we have tend to come from other, other ways, right? That we're used to, right? And, and, uh, and, that, and that's kind of like interesting and, and fascinated in, in its own way, right? But um, it's almost like forcing ourselves, like, you know, like uh, stepping outside the language. And, and, and really see the possibilities, you know, the, the lines of light that Deleuze talks about. Unfortunately, I think that um, our time has reached an end for this uh, session. I want to make sure to acknowledge the work of Sue Carpenter um, to help uh, make this talk happen and create for STEM, for sponsoring, as well as the Prime program. I, we've already received some questions about where the recording will be posted and Sue will be putting that on the Create for STEM website. I think it may all be also be cross posted on Prime's website. Um, so grab it there and feel free to share the link with others. And again, thank you so much, Enio. Um, I, speaking of sensing, it kind of felt like my mind got to take a lawn hot bath <laughs> this hour mm -hmm. with these ideas. So it was really a treat. And um, unfortunately, I had to go to another meeting right now. And it's kind of a hard closure. Um, but this was really a treat. Thank you so much. Thank you for the inter and interaction. Thank you for the wonderful questions and thoughtfulness. And thank you for, for coming. I mean, it's uh, the end of the semester. And, and I see like there was a lot of people, right? Like 30. Amazing. People. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.